here's something that I'm going to tell you as a video guy. Here's why I believe that the lunar landing was fake. Because there is no way you can have a power source that strong at that time in history. And there's no way you could transmit that video signal all the way to Earth. As many of you are aware, I'm an electrical engineer. I have spent the majority of my career in RF communications. I am also a ham radio operator, uh, amateur extra class, uh, call letters KN0DEL, which is very similar to my last name. It's called a vanity call. I was lucky to get it, and it's because I have the amateur extra class. I am also a licensed broadcast engineer with radar endorsements, first class commercial license, now general class. In other words, I'm a nerd extraordinaire and uh, have been involved in communications, computers, electronics my entire life, and you know, it's what I like to do. So as many of you know, I have talked many times about the idea of being able to broadcast signals hundreds of thousands or millions or even hundreds of millions of miles. And I've talked about how ridiculous that idea is to me. And the reason that I say that is because as an RF engineer, I am fully aware of the power requirements to make those kind of journeys. So what I'm going to do today is I'm gonna try and bring everybody a little bit to my world, and I'm gonna explain some basics about RF propagation, antennas, how they work, power gains, and stuff like that. And I'm not gonna go deeply into detail, but I am going to go far enough into detail to show you unequivocally that broadcast to the moon at a distance of 250,000 watts are barely possible and anything beyond you know a million miles is just patently ridiculous and I'm gonna say that you know a lot of examples that I can use and have used before are you know your typical radio stations in Colorado we have a radio station on 850 AM 850 kilohertz AM called KOA, it's a talk radio station, and it is what's known as a clear channel broadcast channel. And during the day, it pretty much has a range, an effective range of, you know, pretty much everywhere around the state. Not 100% coverage by any means, because, you know, Colorado has very mountainous terrains, and that will definitely block signals when you have gigantic rock shields, essentially, that the signal simply cannot penetrate. Now at night, that 50,000 watts remains intact where many other radio stations have to reduce their power at night. And the reason for that is so that they don't interfere with the other radio stations around the country that are on the same frequency. Because if they're all putting out, you know, this 50,000 watt clear channel, all you're going to hear is what's called a heterodyne noise, which is just basically squealing in the receiver. So they actually have to step that power down substantially so that the increased conductivity of the atmosphere and the ionosphere conditions are kind of negated so that the local channels can still broadcast in their local areas without having, you know, massive heterodyne interference and stuff like that. So when it becomes nighttime and the sun goes away and the ionospheric propagation characteristics change, KOA can be heard pretty much all over the country. And I give that, given where Colorado is, that would be to say that on good propagation, it can propagate up to 2,000 miles. And this is in low broadcast frequencies. You take the same power with microwave and the loss, the path loss is just prohibitive. You can't even remotely come to that kind of broadcast distance. But uh, I use 850 kilohertz as an example because it's one of the things that propagates best with the power applied to it. It's the most efficient in the amplifiers and stuff like that. So everybody is familiar with AM radio stations and how you can pick up certain things at night versus the day. Anybody that is familiar with CB radio and the 27 megahertz band knows that there are conditions called skip which allow these CB signals to be heard several states away. And of course, every bandwidth or every frequency spectrum, whether it's HF, VHF, UHF, et cetera, microwave, all have their own propagation characteristics. But there is one thing that all of them share in common, and that includes all forms of electromagnetic radiation, which goes into all the RF frequencies, but also into UV, ultraviolet, infrared, gamma ray, X-ray, and not the least of which would be visible light. They all have to obey 
something that's called the inverse square law. And I've had this up here on the screen for a while. And I'm going to kind of give you an idea about what the inverse square law means. What we talk about when we're talking about the inverse square law is if you have a, an electromagnetic emanation coming off of an antenna or a light bulb or whatever, as it propagates away from the source and depending on you know what type of antenna array it is or whatever, omnidirectional or directional, whatever, it will expand in free space. And so when you have the electromagnetic flux lines that are coming off an antenna or whatever, they are very dense at the source, very, very dense. And then as they propagate away, naturally, if you can visualize in your mind that these flux lines would become more and more sparse and more distributed out so that essentially at any point going away from the source antenna you will have a diminished field strength. Now if the antenna is an omnidirectional type and you're radiating a signal in all directions then that same amount of radio frequency power is diminished in all directions and it diminishes even faster away. But for our purposes what you're looking at here on the diagram is say we had the source radiation and at one meter away from the transmission source let's say you're using a light and it's spreading out over this board that's a meter away three feet away whatever then you're going to have a certain amount of electromagnetic intensity that's going to hit this square grid that's in front of it at one meter but as you propagate away from that source and you go to two meters away from it well now this same flux has got to cover an area that is literally four times the size. That's why they call it the inverse square law. And then as you go out to three meters, then you've got to cover an area that is nine times the size. This is actually very much common sense. I don't think anybody can argue with this. It makes common sense and it is the way that physics portrays it. In fact, I'm looking at a physics course that is actually demonstrating this. And of course, the CIA controlled Wikipedia would agree with this. Why? Because it is demonstrable, testable, and we know that it's for real. So the bottom line here, what I'm saying is, is that when you have a certain amount of intensity at the transmission source, the further you get away, not only does it get weaker because of dispersion, over a wider area because you have a natural signal divergence, the actual strength of it in power measured in watts or milliwatts or microwatts diminishes greatly. Now, there are mitigating factors that can change not this law, this is a law that must be obeyed. However, there are factors that can change the actual radiated signal strength. And that can be by the introduction of various different types of antennas or transducer media. So let's look at antennas first. When you are dealing with an RF frequency, you talk in terms of wavelength and different frequencies have different wavelengths in free space. And what that means is, is that when you are dealing with the frequency in free space, what the wavelength is, is the time that it takes for that frequency to oscillate from baseline all the way up to a positive peak on a sine wave, if you can imagine that, back down to baseline, then going into a negative peak amplitude, and then back to baseline. So the time that it takes for that one cycle or one hertz of wavelength to travel through free space is called the wavelength. The rule of thumb is the lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength, which means that the higher the frequency goes, you will have the shorter wavelength, which is why you will see things like microwave antenna. Microwave antennas can be little bitty, teeny tiny things, not very long at all. And that's because when you're dealing with microwave frequencies, which would be like two gigs or five gigs or 10 gigs, whatever, the wavelength in free space gets much, much, much shorter. When you deal with HF, or high frequencies, the 3 to 30 megahertz band, in free space, the wavelength to go one rotation can be 100 yards or a couple hundred yards, several hundred feet. And then when you get down into the audio frequencies, say you were listening to 60 hertz, which is power frequency, well, if you were going to irradiate that in free space, it could be several miles long or are nearly a mile long, depending on where you're at. So again, it, all electromagnetic waves follow this rule. Whatever spectrum it is, 
So the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. Now, one of the mitigating circumstances that can make a difference on your effective radiated power when you transmit away is a factor of gain that is introduced by the antenna. And you will see sometimes very, very large antenna arrays like the over the horizon radar. And they have these enormous towers that are very, very high and they have several arrays of them. And these antennas are meant to give you the gain to the electromagnetic radiation, more gain in free space so that you have what's called effective radiated power. Now there are several ways that you can go about doing this. You can make the antenna more directional which can increase its decibel gain or effective radiated power, which would be like more like columnating a signal. And a good example of this to think about is if you have a night light in your house, and most night lights are like five watts, and you'll notice that they're just barely, barely lit up so that you know you don't blind yourself getting up to go to the bathroom at night, you know, and you walk into the bathroom. It's just a nice dim light so that you can just see what you're doing around. Those are typically around five watts. But if you take that same five watts and you columnate it in one direction and at a very, very tight, low divergence rate into a laser and you take that same five watts, it'll burn a hole in things quite easily, I might add. So that's the difference and that's something that is akin to bringing that electromagnetic radiation into a high gain antenna. But the bottom line is whatever happens if you have a transmitter that's transmitting at a certain power and you say it's transmitting at, let's say, 100 watts, and you have an antenna that gives you three decibels of gain. Well, the general rule of thumb is, is for every three decibels of gain, you're effectively doubling your effective radiated power. So if I take a 100 watt signal and I put it through a three dB gain antenna, three decibel gain antenna, then I'm going to have an effective radiated power of 200 watts. But this is pretty much true with anything. And again, it all goes back to the transducer. Now. When you take audio frequencies and you have like a 100 watt stereo and it's kicking it and you have a great sound and you put it into your speaker, well, you notice that most speakers are maybe 10 to 12 inches. In other words, they're just a fraction of the wavelengths that they're actually vibrating out and broadcasting. And they sound pretty loud. I mean, you put 100 watts into a speaker, you can probably hear it a couple blocks away with no problem. But if you increase the efficiency of that transducer, by matching the speaker size to more the wavelength of the audio sound. In other words, if you took that speaker and you blew it up to the size of a mountain, which would be more akin to the actual wavelength of audio frequencies, and then you put 100 watts to it, you're gonna hear that sound much, much, much further away because you have increased the gain of the transducer. And in sound, the speaker would be the transducer, in RF, the radio antenna would be considered the transducer. In lasers, the optics would be considered the transducer. So when you get into different spectrums, obviously the frequencies take on different characteristics. So a general rule of thumb then in power is anytime you double your power, you are increasing it in an expression of decibels, which is a logarithmic expression, and you are essentially increasing that power by 3 dB. I'm hoping that I'm not losing anybody because I'm going to get to the meat and potatoes of this here in just a second. And the reason that I have to kind of give you this background to understand a little bit about, you know, where I'm coming from is because we're going to look at another factor which is called free space path loss. Now, what is free space path loss? In terms of a light or electromagnetic emanation, there is a certain amount of calculable and known path loss or attenuation to that signal. In other words, if we're radiating 100 watts off of an antenna and we have a path loss of so many decibels, that means that when that signal gets to an antenna or receive point, it's going to be down significantly from what it was at the transmission point. Now, free space has a very, very, very high path loss as compared to other transmission mediums like your typical cable TV or cables or copper conductors or anything like that. Obviously, you can put a very low level signal of just a few watts into a cable TV coaxial antenna and you can distribute it all over a city without too much problem. Granted, there are separate amplifiers, but the idea is the same here in that when you put 
these type of signals through a cable or a conductor, the path loss goes way, way down because you're increasing the conductivity and, and the order of magnitudes. And the same goes across any type of radiation, you know, power, whatever. It pretty much has to obey the general laws that we're talking about here. So what this physics class, what he's showing here is your basic power of the transmission source. And then this GT, G sub T, is gain of the transmission source. And this is where we get into the gain of the antenna, whether it's really great, big, huge, or whatever, the bigger it is, or the more commensurate in wavelengths that it is in resonance to on the transmission power, the more gain you're going to have, or the more effective radiated power coming off of that. Then you have L, which is path. That is path loss, and in free space, like I just said, path loss is extremely high. And the higher the frequency, by the way, in path loss, the more the severe the path loss will be. In other words, if I was to take a 2.4 gigahertz wireless signal and I had 10 watts of power coming off that 2.4 wireless signal, it's going to go a whole lot less distance than if I were to use 850 kilohertz at 10 watts is going to go much, much, much further because the path loss is less at those lower frequencies. Now this is significant. Why is it significant? Because one of the factors that NASA uses, of course, is they don't use HF or LF or low frequency or anything like that in their communications with their spacecraft. They are using microwave frequencies, which can be anything from, I believe, one gigahertz on up. And I believe typically their frequencies are in the 10 gigahertz range anywhere in there. Let me go back and at least show you these things. I know everybody saw this because I saw this uh, earlier. And this is the inverse square law that I was talking about. When I was talking about the radiation pattern, when you get one meter away, you have so much distribution of, let's call it light, just so you can visualize it easier. One meter away, it pretty much covers this entire square. But when you get two meters away, because of the light divergence, or signal divergence, RF, light, whatever, electromagnetic radiation, you get two meters away and suddenly now, because of the inverse square law, two meters now necessitates that it will become four times less potent or strong at two meters away. And then when you get three times away, the square of three is nine. And so now you have the same source that has to cover a source, a, a receive area of nine times that size. So that's the inverse square law. And I think, you know, pretty much that I was talking about here, we have your power transmit, gain transmitter, and here's your little parabolic dish. And you've all seen on the ISS, the little thing that spins around, or you can use these little parabolic dishes to point at a certain target. And the most common things that people can refer to those at are like the direct TV or dish network dishes. Great. So. He's demonstrating here that you've got your power transmitter, then you've got your gain of the transmitter, which as I just you know talked about, gets you an, a higher effective radiated power. Then from there, you have your path loss, which is extremely high in free space. Then you have kind of the reverse process, the gain of the receiving antenna, and the same rule of thumb goes for the receiving antenna. The larger the antenna you have with respect to the wavelength that you are using, the more gain you're going to be able to pull in. In other words, the more sensitive you're going to be able to receive these signals at. And then you've got power at the receiver. And of course, receivers typically have a threshold of what the minimum amount of signal or power input that can be differentiated from what's called background noise or just you know white noise or something like that. It's, it's basically called the noise floor. So if your signal is coming in below your noise floor, then it doesn't matter how good your receiver is because the noise floor or the noise at the floor has a higher amplitude than the intelligent signal that it's trying to differentiate from. So that's it pretty much in a nutshell. Shell, shell, shell.